Welcome to Daily Living with Father Chapin. Today we are celebrating the Holy Family of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. When the days were completed for their purification according to the law of Moses, they took them up to Jerusalem to present them to the Lord. Just as it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that opens a womb shall be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice of a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons in accordance with the dictate in the law of the Lord. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, awaiting the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he should not see death before he had seen the Christ of the Lord. He came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to perform the custom of the law in regard to him, he took him into his arms and blessed God, saying, Now, Master, you may let your servant go in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you prepared in the sight of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and glory for your people Israel. The child's father and mother were amazed at what was said about him. But Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rise of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be contradicted. And you yourself a sword will pierce, so that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. There was also a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanel, of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived seven years with her husband after her marriage, and then as a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped night and day with fasting and prayer. And coming forward at that very time, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were awaiting the redemption of Jerusalem. When they had fulfilled all the prescriptions of the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. The child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. The Gospel of the Lord, and what a gospel it is, my friend. This is Daily Living on Father Chapin. You stick around, we'll be right back. We're gonna talk about this gospel and a few other things here as we consider God's word and how we might be able to apply it into our daily living. Hi, this is Father Chapin, host of Daily Living with Father Chapin. It is such a pleasure to be able to come into your home each and every week and share the good news, but it's a bit expensive. So I would ask you to consider grabbing a piece of paper and a pencil, and at the next break, I'm gonna share with you some details how you can become a partner with Daily Living. And together, we can take the good news to a lost world. What do you say we get back to the show? Welcome back to Daily Living. Happy almost new year. Oh yes, the Christmas train has run through the station. And as we stand knee deep in wrapping paper, we might be asking ourselves, what was that all about? What did I miss? Our gospel today comes from Luke, featuring one of the few stories in regards to the life of Jesus before he begins his public ministry. Understand, this is not just a story about the baby Jesus, but rather this is a story about the reaction to Jesus from those who are seeking. In a word, it is a story about illumination. When the days were completed for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they took them up to Jerusalem to present them to the Lord. And you know, it's funny, but I think oftentimes many of us forget the fact that Jesus was in fact Jewish. And I'm not talking a little Jewish, I'm talking a real Jewish, which is why the anti-Semitic Christian, it, it, that makes no sense. How can you love Jesus while hating Jewish people? That's crazy. Jesus was, as I said, very Jewish, and his parents, Joseph and Mary, 
were quite devout to what? To Judaism, meaning they observed the law. This, of course, is not lost on Luke. He even ends his gospel with Jesus addressing his disciples for the last time, saying, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. So this emphasis on the Jewishness of Jesus is particularly interesting given the fact that Luke is writing to a Roman official by the name of Theophilus, who is obviously a Gentile. So it seems that Luke is addressing a tension, or perhaps even prejudice, that might exist at the time between Gentile believers and Jewish believers. Oh yeah, prejudice, it's been with us since the very beginning. You can read all about it in the book of Acts, where there were concerns among the Jewish Christians about the Gentile converts. It seems that sides were being formed in the body of Christ before the Gospels were even written. Sadly, this division remains today in what we refer to as denominationalism. And I know I've said this a few times before, but did you know that in this country, Christianity has over 40,000 denominations? I mean, just here in my little town of Nitro, West Virginia, which is just over 6,500 people in population, we got the Kingdom of Life Fellowship Church, we got the Nitro Church of God, we got the Nitro Church of Christ, we got the Lutheran Church, we got the Presbyterian Church, we got the Methodist Church, and of course the Catholic Church, and it goes on and on and on. Divisions, factions, us and them. Meanwhile, Satan laughs. Divide and conquer. And boy, he's done a marvelous job at that, hasn't he? Now, all these denominations come up with their own ritual. In some cases, no ritual at all. But getting back to Jesus and the Jewish faith that he was brought up in, well, it was full of ritual. Imagine it still is. The foundation of Judaism is to praise God throughout all of life, meaning God is to be praised and honored in the morning, midday, afternoon, a whole day. And this is done through ritual. This ritual dictates every aspect of Jewish life, including how they dress, how they eat. Now, of course, today we live in a world that has lost any sense of ritual. Why? Because, you know, we're busy. Our frenetic pace of modern life has resulted in the idea that recognizing God in our daily living for many people has become practically extinct. As a result, God is not found in our daily living, not because he isn't there, but because nobody seems to be seeking. Hence, God becomes this vague concept coming around every Christmas or Easter or when somebody dies. Yes, technology, efficiency, and productivity, it's a good thing, but, well, it comes with a cost. And part of that cost is a loss of ritual. So let's talk about ritual. What is ritual? Well, ritual is defined as a religious or solemn ceremony consisting of a series of actions performed according to a prescribed order. Okay, so, well, that doesn't tell us much. What is the purpose of ritual? Well, may I suggest there are two reasons why we, why we involve ourselves with ritual, and they reflect the two beams of the cross. The first one, the horizontal beam, is the idea of community or unity with other people. I find God in you, you find God in me. The second is the horiz I mean the vertical beam, and, and that is ritual is how we connect to God. So as we get ready to cross into this new year, you might be thinking about some New Year's resolutions, and, and let's just say, for discussion's sake, that one of those New Year's resolutions you're considering is to grow closer to your maker. How would you do that? Well, imagine your New Year's resolution was to grow closer to your wife or your husband. How would you do that? 
Maybe you would start every morning with giving them a hug, right? Well, how do you hug God? Well, that's what ritual is all about. You join with a community of like-minded believers such as yourself, and you praise your creator. That's what ritual is. Now, of course, we live in a world that says, well, you know, I, I'm not really into organized religion. I'm not into religion, really. I'm not religious, but I'm a very spiritual person, whatever that means. What, what does that mean? What does it mean to be a spiritual person? Does that mean that they've come up with their own ritual that they do alone? Does that mean that they're like a really deep thinker? Does that mean that they're exceptionally ethical? What does it really mean to be a spiritual person? Well, stick around, my friend, because that's what we're going to talk about today. When the days were completed for their purification according to the law of Moses, they took them up to Jerusalem to present them to the Lord, just as it is written in the law of the Lord. So, it's the time of their purification. So that word there would seem to be suggesting that two people are in need of purification. And of course, that is the case. There's actually two purifications going on here. The first one is for Mary, because she's just given birth to Jesus. And of course, childbirth involves blood. And according to Mosaic law, any contact with blood makes you ritually unclean. So according to, well, the Judaic law, that if a woman gives birth after 40 days, she is to appear before a priest for a sin offering. So the priest will make an atonement for her sins and she will be cleansed. You can read all about it in the 12th chapter of Leviticus. Now there's a second purification going on, which is called the dedication of the firstborn male to God. Exodus 13 tells us that the firstborn male is to be given to God. Think of it almost like baptism. Joseph and Mary, they're holding their firstborn child, their firstborn son, and they're saying, Father, he is yours. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, awaiting the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he should not see death before he had seen the Christ of the Lord. He came in the Spirit into the temple. So, here we have this man. His name is Simeon. What do we know about Simeon? Well, not much. Simeon doesn't get a whole lot of press in the scriptures. And as far as the Christmas story goes, it seems like the cow and the donkey get more press than Simeon. But don't let that fool you, my friend. In fact, a case could be made, and I intend to make that case today, that Simeon is the one who truly captures the Christmas story. So again, what do we know about Simeon? Well, we know he's righteous. We know he's devout, and we know that he is awaiting the consolation of Israel. So let's start with righteous. What does that mean, righteous? What does that word mean? That word righteous, kind of one of those dinosaur words. You don't hear that word too much. Too much. I mean, I suppose it, it comes up every once in a while, but it's often out of context. Maybe a surfer would say, dude, those were some righteous waves. But of course, that simply reduces the word to simply meaning something good. And let me tell you, my friends, righteous is a whole lot more than simply being good. This is Daily Living on Father Chapin. You hang out. We'll be right back. And we will continue to talk about this amazing gospel that comes to us here as we consider God's word and how we might be able to apply it into our daily living. Hi, this is Father Chapin, host of Daily Living. If you feel like you're being fed by this ministry, I would ask you to prayerfully consider a partnership with Daily Living and what we're trying to do here. 
a monthly gift of any amount that you feel comfortable with, and I will send you a monthly newsletter, and if you provide an email address, a script of the show prior to its broadcast. Just write a check to Daily Living, P.O. Box 339, Nitro, West Virginia, 25143. You can also go on the website at mydailyliving.com and give through PayPal, and together we can shine the light of the good news in a whole lot of dark places. What do you say we get back to the show? Welcome back to Daily Living, not just for the break. We were talking about that word righteous. What does righteous really mean? Well, righteous has a close cousin, and it's one of the cardinal virtues. There's four of them. And I'm talking about fortitude, which is this idea that no matter what happens, no matter how easy it might be or how difficult, no matter how comfortable it might be or uncomfortable, no matter how popular it might be or unpopular, a righteous person is fully committed to doing the next right thing without compromise. Now, as you might imagine, practicing righteousness, especially today, is not easy. We also know that he is devout. So what does that word mean, devout? He's devout. What does that mean? Well, devout means that Simeon was committed to ritual. In other words, he took his faith seriously. He, adhere, he adhered, that's a tough word to say, he adhered, he followed the law of Moses very closely. So what else do we know about Simeon? Well, we can infer that through his practicing of righteousness and devotion to ritual that God had given him ears to hear that quiet voice. Why? Because we are told that the Spirit of the Lord is upon him. So we know he's a seeker, and we know that through his seeking, he's able to hear from God, which, my friends, goes way beyond pew-sitting. Simeon was a praying man who knew how to listen. So, since we brought it up, let's talk about prayer for a moment. What is prayer? Let me begin by asking this question. Do we take the time to pray? And you might be asking yourself, well, I don't know, Father C, what exactly are you talking about? I guess what I'm saying is, do you ever talk to God? And of course, I'm sure many would say, oh yeah, sure, I talk to God all the time. So again, I ask you this, okay, so if you're praying and you're talking to God, what are you saying? Understand there's four types of prayer. You have adoration, 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 contrition, thanksgiving, and petition. And as we consider our prayer life, if we're being honest, I think that most of us live in the prayer of petition. God is Santa Claus and we have our list. Lord, give me this. Lord, give me that. Lord, help me with this. Lord, help me with that. Or maybe it's a bit more noble and we're praying for other people. Lord, help out Dan. Lord, help out Donna. You know, in these prayers, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with these prayers. But don't you see that these prayers are directing God to do something? Now, why not consider another kind of prayer? How about, not my will, Lord, but thy will be done? Remember that one? The perfect prayer coming out of the Garden of Gethsemane. Or how about, Lord, give me eyes to see what you would want me to see. Or how about, Lord, give me ears to hear what you would want me to hear. How about that? How about show me your will? And then, and this is really important, listen to the answer. In other words, listen for the quiet voice. If there's one thing we can all agree upon with Simeon, as he definitely knew how to listen. We know this because the Spirit was leading him. He was devout in ritual. He was righteous. Therefore, he was illuminated by the Holy Spirit. So today we find Simeon, and he's in the temple just another day. Could have been a Tuesday. And this peasant couple out of the backwoods of Nazareth has just arrived in the holy city with their newborn baby. 
and the baby's about 40 days old. Now understand, they're not the only couple there with a baby for the purification rite. I'm sure this must have been purification day, and I'm sure there was a big crowd, a lot of babies. But as Simeon looked over the crowd, something caught his eye, and he received his promise. Oh my Yahweh, it's Yahweh. And then this is where we get the famous prayer of Simeon. Lord, now you can let your servant go in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. My own eyes have seen what you have prepared in the sight of every people, a light revealed upon the nations and the glory of your people, Israel. In other words, Lord, you can let your servant depart in peace now. In other, other words, it means, Lord, I'm at peace now and I'm ready to come home. In other, other, other words, it means, Lord, let me die. And in my mind's eye, I can just see this old man with sparkling deep blue eyes, full of joy, with maybe a long white beard. You know, I'm thinking somebody like Gandalf in The Lord of the Rings. You know, I don't know. Of course, we don't know what he looked like physically, but we do know what he looked like spiritually. He was illuminated. Why? Because he was seeking. Consequently, he was one of the first people in all of history to recognize the Creator entering into human history. Understand, Caesar, with all his power, he didn't recognize him. The high priests, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they didn't recognize him. None of the great men of Israel recognized him. But this old man in the temple could see what nobody else could see. Now, we know that old saying, seeing is believing, but for Simeon, believing allowed him to see. And now as he holds this baby in his arms, the Spirit allows him to see something else. When he says, behold, this child is destined for the fall and rise of many in Israel and a sign to be contradicted. And you yourself a sword will pierce so that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. So clearly Simeon is seeing into the future. But imagine, I mean, Mary must be thinking, hey, give me my baby back. These must be extremely troubling words. The rise and fall of many, a sign to be contradicted, meaning this child will be loved by many, but this child will be hated by many. And boy, isn't that true? I mean, if you don't believe that, try bringing up the name of Jesus in the public square. He's either loved or he's hated. Not a whole lot in the middle. So what have we learned today? How can we apply this gospel into our daily living? How is it that Simeon represents the true story of Christmas? Well, let me start by asking you a simple question. If you were to hold the baby Jesus in your arms, would you be able to recognize him? Or more to the point, if the quiet voice spoke into your heart, would you be able to recognize it? My friends, if all this Christmas celebration has left you feeling a little hollow as this Christmas train has just roared through, maybe you feel like you're standing at the station holding your bags, thinking you might have missed something. Consider a New Year's resolution. Consider righteousness. Consider the next right thing to do. Understand that God is not going to show you the whole thing. Oh, no, but he will show you the next right thing to do. And guess what? When you do it, <laughs> he'll show you the next right thing to do. The road goes on forever. And if you do that, then you will be walking in the Spirit, just like Simeon. Consider this new year, devotion. Consider ritual. Find a place where you can practice ritual. 
If you're near Nitro, we got plenty of seats available. And finally, the most importantly, why not take the time this year to try to learn how to pray? Try to carve out at least a few minutes every day to ask God to show you what he would have you do. Just as if you were trying to improve your relationship with your wife or your husband or family or friends or anybody for that matter. What would that require? It would require time. Imagine you had a friend and the only time you heard from that friend is when they needed something. What kind of friend would that be? We don't want to be that friend. Why not take some time today? and check in with God. My friends, the story of Simeon is the true story of Christmas. It's the story of illumination, holding the baby Jesus with the shadow of the cross falling all over him. Understand, it was the righteousness of Simeon. It was the devotion of Simeon that gave him eyes to see. This year, let us take the child of hope into our arms and really try to practice righteousness. Let us really try to practice devotion. Let us live our lives as if we were truly righteous and devoted people. And who knows, if we practice righteousness long enough, if we practice devotion long enough, we might actually become righteous and devout people. And God will give us ears to hear the quiet voice. God will give us eyes to see, and we will walk in the Spirit. And that Spirit will guide us home. You know, every day in this country, Somebody does something nice for somebody else. Today, why don't you let that somebody be you? Because the best vitamin for a Christian is B1. This is Daily Living. I'm Father Chapin. Hope you can come back next week and we'll do it again. Until then, I hope you let God live in your life. And I bless you. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.